Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished players, authors, content creators, and improvers about their lives, their careers, and about ways that you might be able to improve your own chess game. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined this week by a rising chess YouTube star. His channel is called Chess Vibes, and with 95K subs at the time of recording, it's been uh, uh, growing uh, exponentially. Um, Away from the board, our guest is a 34-year-old Texas-based dad. He's a USCF master who was the North Carolina representative at the prestigious Denker Tournament of State Champions in 2006, and he won that tournament, um, spent some time away from chess, but then he launched his channel in September of 2020, and after a slow start, he's just seen rapid growth. He's got a very clear and relatable presentation style, and I can see why his channel has blown up, but I want to hear it from himself. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show uh, Nelson Lopez, a.k.a. Chess Vibes. Nelson, how are you? Good, good. Thank you, Ben. That's quite the introduction. But, Appreciate it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's quite the bit of success you've had, Nelson. So I just want to dive right in. We'll get to all the life chess chit chat later, but let's talk about your channel. So amazing success in a relatively short period of time. Do you have any operating theories? I mean, of course, your content is great, and I can give what I think are my own guesses. But what's your guess for why your channel has caught on when some others might uh, get be a little slower out of the gate, Nelson? Yeah, good question. So when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I didn't know anything about YouTube. I I didn't even really know about recording. I was kind of nervous about the whole um, recording, throwing myself out there on the internet. It just seemed like a scary thing. But I just started with some basic videos, how to play chess. And my my goal at the time was to just do 1% better um, every time. And so that's kind of, well, I think we'll talk about that later about the, the video. But that was my motto with YouTube was like, all right, let's just, you know, whatever I can fix from the first video, one thing, and we'll make the second video a little bit better than that one. And I just kind of kept moving forward with that. And then there was one video in particular, top 35 chess principles. And uh, when I posted that, I guess YouTube really liked that one. And they started pushing that one a lot. I remember at the time I was about 5,000 subscribers. And then that one just took off. um, And I guess went semi-viral and just really uh, gained a lot of a lot of subscribers really quickly from there. And so that was that was kind of my big breakthrough, I guess you could say. And how long had you been making videos when that happened, Nelson? Uh, I think it was about five or six months okay. into the, the journey. Yeah. But yeah, very slow at the beginning. I mean, I remember days where I would post a video and it was like three views, you know, <laughs> and like, man, how, how am I ever going to make this work? But yeah, I just I did a lot of. Um, uh, posting on Reddit, the chess subreddit, try to get some, some hits there. And it, it didn't really work out very well, but just kept posting videos. And yeah, that, that, that 35 principles one really took off. So amazing. Yeah. And I want to hear more about that, but like, first of all, Nelson, what was your, your motivation? Are you like a, a YouTube kind of sore? Was it like a rekindled interest in chess? Were you looking for a way out of your day job? Like what, what, what was the primary driver? Right. Yeah. So a little bit of both. Um, I was interested at the time in passive income and, you know, I like the idea of being self-employed and and kind of being able to do my own thing. But at the time I had no idea what that was going to look like. And then, like you mentioned, yeah, I hadn't really played chess much since college. So I went to UTD and after I graduated, you know, got the, the typical day job, got married, had some kids and didn't really play chess anymore. And so it was a way to kind of bring chess back, you know, into my life. And and share what I had learned. I felt like I had a lot of knowledge that I just wasn't really doing anything with. And so it felt, it felt good to share that with people. And uh, I try to keep it mostly on beginner intermediate level and and just, because I knew there was a lot of new people into the game and I just wanted to share what I, what I knew. So. Okay. Yeah. And UTD, of course, big university of Texas at Dallas, Uh, John Bartholomew, probably their most famous chess alumni who you were saying you had a slight overlap with at school, right, Nelson? Right, right. Did that inspire you at all? You're like, well, I mean, this this I am who went to my school is a chess YouTube legend, so why why shouldn't I do it? Um, you know what? I I didn't really think about it too much. Um, it was just kind of like let let me just try this and see where it goes, and um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know if I knew that he had his his channel at the time. I, I just kind of didn't I didn't really know much, to be honest with you, Ben. I was just kind of jumping in and and uh, was going to see what happened. So, yeah, yeah. It, I kind of get that sense just from because, of course, I've been binging your videos in recent days. I mean, as I mentioned to you in email, like I've gotten a bunch of suggestions from um, Patreon subs of Perpetual Chess as your channel has caught on. You've got a lot of fans. So, um, right. Right. And I do get the sense, like, especially when I watch you recap the tournaments, which we'll talk about later, the tournament you played in, that you're kind of parachuting back in, which a lot of people can can relate to. But on the other hand, your ability to explain basic chess ideas uh, in a digestible way is like, clearly, that's why your channel has taken off. Like, you just have this sort of natural born teacher style. So do you have any right. theories of where that comes from, Nelson? Uh, that's a good question. A, a lot of people have mentioned that. I, I think one thing growing up, I've always been kind of sympathetic towards other people. And I think that plays a role when I'm teaching and explaining. So I've been around a lot of people who are maybe new to chess or don't really know as much about it as somebody who's played their whole life. And I've I've always been able to kind of put myself in their shoes and kind of understand, you know, somebody who's never seen this before is going to have questions about this or this or this. And so I really want to focus on the basics and not go over their head and just assume that they, that they know, you know, things that they don't. And so I think that's probably part of it. I think but, so um, too. Yeah. I think, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. And they advise like when you're writing something, uh, they might advise, like, think of a specific person, you know, that you're targeting, like, because mm -hmm. like that way it can, you know, exactly who your audience is. So do you have someone in mind that you're presenting to like a, a, a less experienced chess player that has some knowledge or does it more sort of a general think of the audience when you are crafting your videos? Yeah, I've heard that advice too. Um, it's more general for me. I did go through, uh, I guess you could say a phase at the, at the beginning when I was posting videos where I was kind of doing a lot of experimenting and what I realized was there were some people who would, would comment something on one of my videos and say, you know, this is kind of basic. Like, I think you should really focus on more advanced things. And what I realized was those people were the minority. Mm -hmm. Like most people weren't having those questions. It was very rare that somebody would say that. Most people were, were asking questions like, um, can you slow down a little bit? Wait a minute. I didn't understand, you know, what, what happened. And I realized that I needed to focus more on the, those beginners and intermediate players as opposed to the maybe the, the 1600 who was watching my video or something like that. So if to the extent that there is a, a rating target, what would you say it is? Yeah, most most videos probably uh, under 1400. Yeah, if I had to choose, I mean, I have some that, that are, you know, higher than that, but the, the majority is under 1400, I would say. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and again, great presentation style, very good at breaking things down into sort of um, simple lists of rules and stuff like that. Like what, what frames your own chess knowledge? Where did, do you have any favorite books? Did you have an influential coach? Like, where do you think uh, you got, got this information that you're now you're able to dispense uh, from? Right. Yeah. So growing up, uh, my dad just taught me and uh, he, he was decent, but he never played seriously. He's probably a, I don't know if I had to guess, maybe like 1200 player. He didn't ever study or anything. He just taught me. And um, I, Growing up, didn't really have uh, a coach that we paid for. My parents didn't couldn't afford that. But I had one uh, really good friend of mine, shout out to Rodney if he ever hears this, but he was a 2100 who kind of just took me under his wing when I was a kid and volunteered to teach me some basic stuff. And so I learned a lot from him. And then uh, just, just playing and practicing, I didn't really read too many books. Um, I remember I had a Bishop B5 Sicilian book. Which you still stand uh, for, right? <laughs> right, right. So I learned I learned a lot from that one, and then uh, just the modern chess openings. Um, but other than that, I, I didn't really have a lot of books. I just kind of played a lot and tried to learn from my mistakes. Cool, impressive. Yeah, and and I uh, I found an old article from U.S. Chess Online about when you won the Denker in 2006, written by Jen Chahadi back when she was writing her content, uh, writing the content for U.S. Chess Online, and it had a quote from your dad where he basically said. You know, and I think at that point, I, I can't remember the specifics, but you had either already won the the full chess scholarship to University of Texas at Dallas or that enabled you to win it. But he said, we've been like active looking for chess scholarships. So I thought it was cool that like 
you know, you had the first go around where chess enabled you to to help get you to college um, and, and, you know, help make college affordable. And now here we've come back around and suddenly chess is turning into a profession for you all over again. Right, right. Yeah, that was that was something I remember I had applied to we lived in North Carolina, I had applied to uh, NC State and I thought, okay, this is just the local school, I'll go here. But then there was UTD, which I, I was really interested in, but I didn't, uh, at the time, I wasn't even a master. I was about 2,100, and I didn't know if I was high enough for them. And so, but we applied anyway, and they, uh, yeah, I ended up getting the scholarship. Actually, before I won the Denker, they had given me the scholarship. And then the, when winning the Denker was just kind of like the, the cherry on top, you know. That That's huge. Yeah. And were you a, were you a good student? Uh, yeah, I was pretty good. I mean, I, I was probably... Mostly A's, a couple of classes, not, but yeah, mostly A's and pretty okay. good. Cool. And, and so you've, you've mentioned a few times you went to a nine to five and you're, you know, you're 34 now. So you've been on the grind for a while in terms of like a uh, real world job. So what have you been doing? Yeah. So I worked at, uh, I worked as an IT developer. So software development, um, I went to school for uh, software engineering. And so I, you know, I, I didn't mind that, but, uh, after so many years, it's, it, get, it, get, it got a little old and I wanted to kind of do something different. And I, I miss chess. I didn't really play anymore, like I said. So having something to get back and, and not only just play, but like share my knowledge was, I guess I never really thought about being a teacher too much, but I do really enjoy it. So, yeah. And you mentioned uh, just before we're, we recorded that you, you did just recently quit your job. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah, yeah it's been sorry. Go ahead. Something. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, but that's that's a serious career to to set aside. And and I know you're a dad. So is it like a difficult decision for you or you're just like, I have to do it? Yeah, no, it was definitely um, a decision that that we've thought about for a while. Uh, you know, talked with my wife and we have two young kids. So it wasn't something that I wanted to rush, right, and, and jump in uh, too early. So uh, we waited for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, the 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 trajectory of the channel has been growing quickly. And then one of the things that I did, which really helped a lot was launch some courses. Um, I have a course on uh, strategic thinking from 1000 to 1500 to help players go from 1000 to 1500. And then another one I just finished on the Kings Indian, um, like an in-depth guide to that. So that really helped um, with as far as pay the bills and, and see where the income was at. So but yeah, it's it's very exciting. I mean, I've I've loved it so far. It's only been about a month or two, but I've really enjoyed uh, enjoyed it so far. It's such an awesome story. Congratulations, man! Yeah, thanks. And um, it must help with your videos a lot. I mean, to, you know, if you compare coming home from a nine to five and trying to put something together versus being able to spend hours on it, are you noticing? Um, are you feeling like you're able to put forth a superior quality product? Yeah, definitely. And actually, the biggest thing. Before I was uh, working all day at my day job, and then it was kind of like nights and weekends when I would crank out the videos, and so it was really my family that was getting the the short end of the stick. You know, I wasn't having a lot of time to spend with them. So now I've been able to kind of do both. I can spend more time with my family, and then also get uh, you know a, a good amount of videos out each week. So living the dream, man! It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, and we have one question from a Patreon sub. So shout out to Alex Friedman. And this question is related to one of your videos, as you alluded to earlier. And I had sent you the question. So uh, one of your most popular videos is uh, about the 1% rule um, in which, um, well, I'll let you explain. But first, let me read Alex's question. Uh, sure. He says, hi, Nelson. I liked your video about the 1% rule. Could you talk a little about that? And about what to do when the accumulation of knowledge doesn't translate to actual results. And Nelson, before I uh, give you a chance to answer that question, I should have mentioned uh, Patreon subs to Perpetual Chess can um, can send in questions for the guests. Just mentioning that in case uh, Nelson's legions of fans give this pod a listen. But anyway, uh, so Nelson, <laughs> what, what would you say to Alex's question? Yeah, so good question. So like I mentioned at the, the start, um, the one of the one of the things when I started the YouTube channel that I tried to do was, uh, inc you know, follow the one percent rule basically. And so it was every time I posted a video afterwards, I would kind of ask myself, okay, what's one thing that I can improve about this video? And I mean, at the beginning, I, I had no idea what I was doing as far as the settings to use for my mic and the 
the the background and and uh, the colors and there's so many things i just was like, experimenting and so i said okay let's just pick one thing try to make it a little bit better each time and that really i think that really helped me with the youtube channel as i went along and then i I don't know, just one day I was thinking of, okay, let's think of a, of a video idea. And it just kind of got the idea like, you know, I think this actually applies to chess. When I think back to my experience learning chess, really you can break down a lot of the skills that you need to have into bite-sized chunks. And that's kind of what the point of the the 1% rule is. I think people tend to think, of course, chess is a complex, complicated game, but um, if you break it into bite-sized chunks, you can actually learn a lot over the course of a couple of months or a year or two if you just separate it out that way. And so that's that's kind of what I was going for. Um, as far as the second part of that question and it, you know, learning these new things and it not correlating to results, um, I guess there's, I think there's two things. Number one, I think some people think they know what they need to work on, but they actually are missing the mark. And so you have people who think, oh, my openings are so weak. I really need to learn more opening theory. But then they're they're making blunders every other move or something, and it's like, well, I think you have a bigger problem. And if you're if you're confused about what you should be learning, um, I think that can be why. So you're learning new stuff, but you're not learning the right types of things. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other part of it, I think, is uh, you know, chess is complicated. I don't mean that the one percent rule to, to be like you know oversimplifying chess. I think you do have to spend a lot of time learning a lot of different new things, and over time, you gradually will start to see those results it doesn't really happen overnight so yeah and and i want to get back to the last part of alex's question because i do think it was it's valid um but one other thing i'm just curious about so the one percent rule it's actually i mean it's come up on the podcast a few times of course because um you know james clear wrote about it in his book atomic habits and uh um, a friend of the pod, James Altucher, has been on a couple times, and he is uh, quick to admit that he like he writes about it in in his writing, and he's a chess master himself. So I'm just curious, like where where you came across it? Are you a James Clear fan, or was it just like reading something online, or, or like because it sounds like it frames so much of uh, your work, Nelson? Uh, yeah, no. So um, one of the things when I'm trying to come up with video ideas is I'll just. Sometimes I'll go outside, I'll take walks, or if I'm driving in the car, I'll just think about random things and, and whatever kind of pops in my head, I'll think, can I make a video out of this? And so I had been thinking about you know my YouTube channel and how even I think in other things in life, you can uh, apply that sort of you, you break skills. Uh, if you break complicated skills down into parts, that's how you can really learn complicated things. And so I just thought, hey, this applies to chess. So no, I didn't really get it from anywhere else other than than that, just kind of thinking so, through those things. So you named it the one percent rule on like on on your own, like independently. Correct. Wow, yeah. that's amazing because yeah. it's like it's like in the cult. I'm not I'm not like saying I'm not calling into doubt what you're saying. To be clear, it's just like it's it's interesting how that works. It's like you know in history, there's also many examples of things being invented by two different people in different places, but. But yeah, I mean, and and like James Clear likes to give the examples of like compound interest where like if, you know, if you're getting better at something, one and James Altucher quotes this in, uh, in his book, Skip the Line, um, where like if you're getting 1% better at something every day, then after a year, you're 37x better at it. Like, you know, these these crazy stats. But but anyway, right. I mean, more importantly, I want to bring it back to Alex's question, because um, I think James himself, James Altucher himself, would concede that there can be a disconnect when it comes to chess, because as Alex alluded to, I think we all often feel like, especially like as you get more advanced, you're gaining knowledge, but it's not necessarily translating to better results. Does 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 that resonate with you? Yeah, and I mean, I've I've even experienced that myself, where I I'll spend uh, several hours, let's say, learning a, a particular opening or learning. You know, working on a particular tactic or whatever, and I feel like I've I've learned a significant skill, but then I go and play some games, and it's like, yeah, I'm still losing. You know, I'm not winning more games based on this, and I think that's where it comes back to like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I think you just got to keep at it, and you got to keep adding those those skills, and eventually, it 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 at some point it clicks, and it's like, okay, now I'm starting to see results, but I don't think it happens right away. Yeah, yeah, and. and and I mean, you know, these things are all like, like when James Clear writes about the one percent rule, like, you know, he's inspiring you, uh, the proverbial you, anyone, 
to try to get better at something. And as you say, it's worked extremely well with your YouTube channel to to just uh, constantly try to improve every day. But I do think that chess, it's it's so measurable and it's also so complex that I do think that like, you know, when I, you know, again, shout out to James Altucher. I'm a big fan of his work. But when you try to like just apply that to chess, like there's just exponential growth doesn't really happen in chess. Like when you're, yeah, an, when you're, you're exactly right when you're an adult, but you growth can happen, but not exponential growth. You're exactly right. Yeah. I had a lot of people comment on that video saying that uh, kind of sarcastically, like, okay, I'll apply this and I'll be, yeah. you know, rated, rated 3000 in a, in a couple of months or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I chose the one percent rule because it was sort of a I made it for a good thumbnail and it was clickable. Yeah, and, and again, uh, I'm not trying to call you out at all. It's just it's something that, like you say, you struggle with it. I struggle with it too. Like I'm I'm on the grind trying to get better at chess, and we'll, we'll talk about that more just as as we will with your with your game. And yeah, it just never ceases to amaze how how challenging it is. Right. Right. And in fact, Nelson, I think I want to get into that next. But first, we're gonna uh, take a break and hear from our sponsors. Listeners, I've got good news. I know you're looking for an update on my AIM Chess analytics, and I'm happy to report that I'm now only behind on the clock in Blitz Chess 69% of the time. Huge progress. So if I can keep up that 2% improvement in no time, I'll always be ahead on the clock, and I'll probably win more games because of it. And of course, with AIMChess.com, you can use their algorithm to dissect your own game, look at trends from openings, different phases of the game. Uh, And of course, they give you actionable puzzles based on whatever your strengths and weaknesses are. So go to aimchess.com and check it out. They automatically scrape your games from the major chess playing sites to give you the insights you need to work on your game. So if you go to aimchess.com and decide to subscribe, be sure to use the code PERPETUAL30. Links in the show notes. So let's get back to the show. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by BetterHelp.com. If you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or another mental health issue, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist in under 48 hours. It's professional therapy done securely online. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. You can send a message to your therapist anytime. Uh, It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is available. You can go to their website to see lots of testimonials. Uh, If you do, please visit visit betterhelp.com slash chess. And if you do use that URL, you would save 10% off of your first month if you choose to sign up. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash chess. And of course, the links are in the show description as well. And we are back. And Nelson, we might as well get into it. I mean, of course, I like all your videos, but being that your target audience is 1,200 and I'm like, um, you know, a washed up master, <laughs> former 2,200, now 2,100, I'm, I'm not the target audience for all your videos, but I dove deep into your tournament recaps because you you uh, made a comeback in November and did like a Levy Rosman style um, round by round breakdown. Could you tell us about that experience? I mean, of walking into a tournament hall for the first time in uh, I think it was 10 years or so for you. Yeah, it was, I think it was about eight years. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was something. Um, I, you know, I, in my mind, I had it like, oh, it's going to come back to me pretty quickly. Um, I think maybe one game or two games, I'll feel, you know, a little nervous, and then it'll just all come back. And that wasn't quite the experience I had. I think I scored, uh, I can't remember if it was three or three and a half out of nine, and I lost like forty, at least forty points that tournament. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, got rusty. Um, and, uh, I I think we were talking about this earlier, how, you know, some of the younger kids these days, they, they're really strong. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was surprised I I played a couple actually in that tournament and, um, their, their opening knowledge is very, very good. Like they, they, they're up to, you know, up to, um, date on their theory and then tactically they're very sharp. And so, yeah, I, I had a tough time for sure. Yeah, I mean, as a fellow now, I can say twenty one hundred. You were you were twenty two, and you're closer to twenty two than I am. Um, but that was one thing that struck me in watching your videos. Is like, I mean, I know you were saying like you knew going in that openings were something you needed to work on, and openings didn't necessarily decide the game that often. But it did strike me like there's just like just to catch you up. There's just been an absolute explosion in in opening knowledge in particular. I think in part to 
uh, friends of the pod and sponsors Chessable, um, but also just generally like online age, like you mentioned MCO earlier, like now everyone's mm-hmm. got the the online opening encyclopedias like and the kids with their fertile minds, like their openings are tight and they're able to drill tactics just effortlessly. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's a whole new world out there. Right. And even like this chess engines have come such a long way. I mean, we had them back when I was studying, but they weren't at the same you know level that they are now. It's, it's just so easy to, to hop into Stockfish and see, you know, the best moves. And um, if you can remember it, like, yeah. Yeah. So what was you seemed you seem Nelson like I know the results didn't go the way you went it you wanted and but honestly like again as a similar strength player watching your videos I felt you did pretty well for just walking in cold you know after eight years but um did it you know did you enjoy the experience did it make you want to play more or was it like uh disheartening Oh, no. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. I'm glad I did it. Um, I actually have another tournament coming up in a couple of weeks. So oh, I'm excited nice. about, about that. But one thing um, that I will say that I think played a played a big role was, you know, physically um, having a job in IT for the past, you know, so many years prior to, to quitting. Uh, I haven't gotten a lot of exercise, just physical exercise. I'm just not in the shape that I used to be. I used to play racquetball and soccer and and all sorts of you know sports and things and I think mentally um being in in good physical shape actually helps you um with those longer games and and like I had one um one day I had two two really long games total about nine hours of playing and I I mean I remember at the end of those games I was like Mm -hmm. my brain was just like I'm I'm just tired I'm not I'm not thinking clearly I'm not coming up with good ideas I'm, I'm not finding you know the right moves here and so I think that's a huge thing that I need to to work on going forward for sure. Yeah, especially with as you say with the two games a day yeah, and I could see I could see you were getting tired as I like made my way through the the recaps and mm-hmm. it's totally understandable but yeah, and that's one thing where the kids have have a big advantage is they just have so much so much more energy. So but what's your next tournament Nelson? I mean it might so yeah, as I this will be out in about 12 days from when we're recording here on February 10th. Um um, but I'm curious where you'll be playing. Yeah. So the next tournament is the, the Southwest class tournament and it's uh, another nine round tournament. Wow. So it's going to be very similar to the last one. Um, two, I think two rounds most days. And so we'll see how that goes. Um, I will say one thing too, that's been a challenge is doing the recaps in between. Yeah. Is, is tough because one thing I used to do prior is I would like after my round, I just go back to the hotel, take a nap rest up, get some food, you know, and uh, now I have to get, you know, do the recap and stuff. So that, that's all kind of makes it a little bit difficult. Yeah. And from a content perspective, I was talking about this with, I am Kostya Kravutsky of chess dojo recently. Cause he's, he does amazing recaps, but he also struggles with like, you know, I'm there competing. I'm trying to win this tournament, you know, like, right. I, like what are my priorities? Um, right. And um, so my question for you is like, how was it from a pay a view count perspective? Like Levy, like Rosman, when he does his recaps, they're his most popular videos. I mean, so I think that he feels like it, he can't set it to the side. Whereas Kostya, um, you know, YouTube is like a, a good side hustle for him, but he's a chess trainer first and foremost. And those tournaments are a big commitment. Like, so where are you coming down on this? Is your first priority going to be the YouTube channel or is your first priority going to be like maximize your results? Yeah. So I think right now, um, the, the first priority is the YouTube channel. Yeah. And, uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm definitely going to try to win. I'm definitely going to keep competing, but, uh, yeah, right now, since I just quit the, quit my job, (laughs) that makes sense. focusing on the the finance side right now, but yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And again, the trajectory is huge. So how were the the views on those compared to like your, your general instructional videos? Yeah. They weren't as much as uh, some of the other more popular. I noticed. Yeah. 10, maybe 10 to 20% of the total subscribers, which is not bad. Um, You know, my loyal fans were watching, but right. Yeah. Comments comments seemed like uh, effusive. Yeah. Yeah. Very supportive. Yes. Um, Yeah. But I mean, I, I was thinking about why that might be. And I think part of it is, as you mentioned, your target audience 
is 1200 Levy, if I had to guess, I mean, he could answer this better, but I would say his target audience is maybe 15, 1600. I mean, also obviously his presentation style. Like I love, I love all the uh, swings. I mean, generally, obviously he's entertaining, but when he does the tournament things, he'll always be like, and then he hit me with this <laughs> like, right. and the sort of like right. outsized reaction to this move, um, you know, which I, I find very entertaining, but I also think it makes it more relatable for the audience. Like he really, sure. he really, uh, you know, um, um, illustrates the the conflict that a tournament player feels more than than other presenters. But anyway, that's a long way of saying I think part of it might be that like you're playing at a level pretty far beyond your um, your audience. So you do a great job explaining things. Like I'm really impressed with like how you know when to point out a basic tactic and stuff like that. But I still think maybe that's that's part of it. But but like as a content as a fellow content creator, I definitely think it you you got to give it more than one shot as you're doing. Yeah, for sure. I think you're you're right on with that. And then I could probably work on my thumbnails a little bit too. I just had the uh, <laughs> the hotel background, you know. Yeah, so, I'm I'm jealous of YouTube creators in some respects, but when it comes to thumbnails, I'm just like, man, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that crap. And, right. and uh, you know, I do post my my uh, audio only podcast on YouTube. Shout out to anyone who consumes it that way. But yeah, I just mail it in on the thumbnails and everything. Like it's just not uh, not my priority. Right. Sure. But yeah, I mean, now you've got to you've got to take that stuff seriously. So uh, in terms of the one percent rule. W- what else are you working on on your channel? Do you have like uh, series that are really resonating that you're looking to double down on, like things you're hatching up? What, what's going on with it, Nelson? Yeah, I'm a little bit all over the place. I've got a lot of things going. I have a kind of signed my first partnership with, uh, actually, I'm not allowed to talk too much about it yet. It's it's coming soon. So I'll be doing some new videos with uh, a team of, of folks. So I'm excited about that. Oh, nice. Kind of, Congrats. Kind of a, yeah, thanks. It's kind of a side Uh, venture so that's taking up some of my time um yeah as far as like the one percent rule um i'm I'm kind of to the point i'm like i'm not sure i'm focusing on patreon a little bit i'm trying to get that going i had created a while ago and i didn't put as much time into it as i would like to so i'm trying to ramp that up again Uh, i'm also creating different courses so that's kind of a side thing basically trying to diversify i it's funny i quit my job on december 22nd and then January 1st, I, I realized that the ad revenue actually goes way down because uh, leading up to Christmas, the ad prices are like oh, interesting. higher. And then as soon as, as soon as January half hits, you like mine went was cutting the cut in the third. And so that was a big hit. Oh, and my so goodness. I, That's yeah, a huge like, difference. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and so I, I realized like, OK, I probably need to diversify a little bit. Don't put all my eggs in one basket kind of a thing. So. Uh, I'm working on that now. And, and yeah, I mean, I do think actually what's been, been nice is just responding to comments and answering questions from comments. I get a lot of good ideas from people just asking questions in the comments and it's like, oh, that's, that's a really good idea. And you're not the first person who's asked that. Let me do a video on that. And some of my most popular videos have come from just questions that people have asked and wanted to, to know more about. Yeah. And as we mentioned, I mean, I do feel like uh, a strength of yours is sort of your your um, empathy, your your ability to relate to your students. So I'm sure reading the comments and thinking about it helps with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you notice? Like, I, I'm sure in the comments, you get a lot of questions about like how to help players around that level. What What is your best advice to like your typical viewer for for how like bullet points of how to how to improve their own games uh yeah so i mean i think for a lot of the new players it's learning how to not make so many mistakes um that was one of the things that growing up i always felt like i was pretty good at paying attention to detail and and being pretty accurate with whatever i learned I, i tried to be very precise and very accurate and not mess it up and i i think that's something that a lot of people struggle with they they might learn an opening or they might learn a tactic or they might learn a skill. And then they, while they're trying to implement it in their game, they just kind of make a mistake along the way. And, you know, you know, in chess, one mistake is all it takes. Right. And, and it can, game can be over depending on, on the level of the mistake. And so that's something I focused a lot on. I have a couple of videos on, on not making blunders. Um, I have a series where I analyze um, 
a whole bunch of games from players in, in a certain rating range. And then I kind of compile the most common mistakes and those have been pretty popular. And, and it really just kind of sh- points out and highlights, okay, this is what people in this range really need to focus on. And a lot of it comes down to, to blunders and, and just, you know, mistakes that you can really fix if you, uh, if you work on that. So how, how do people fix it? Like, what should they do? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think just, at the level below uh, 1200 or so it's, it's blunder checks. Like you gotta, yeah. you gotta stop every, every move and, and just make sure you're checking a couple things. And uh, a lot of people just don't do that. They, they, they just get caught up in the, their plan, what they're trying to accomplish in the game. And they don't stop and just say, hold on a second. Let me, let me see which of my pieces are undefended. Let me just see which, which of my pieces are being attacked right now. Let me, you know, things like that. Gotcha. And do you have any thoughts of, of doing lessons? I mean, I'm sure you've gotten some inquiries. Yeah, as far as private lessons, yeah, yeah, I get asked that question a lot, and um, right now I've decided I have too much going on as far as other things that I have going on. It's it's not completely. Uh, um, I, I may come back to it at some point, but right now I'm, I'm not taking private students. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Um, and let, bringing it back to your own game, Nelson. So you have a tournament in a couple of weeks. What like you maybe have a bit more time than before because you're not working. So, uh, what, how are you approaching it? Are you, are you doing any studying? Um, yes. So some studying, I, uh, when I put together the King's Indian course, actually did a lot of learning for that because I I wasn't really a a native King's Indian player. And so I'm going to try that in the tournament. Um, Partly yeah, because you were I, I struggling just, with the Benko. You were like, I, when they yeah. play D4, you're just like deflated. You're yes, like, yes. Like, well, oh, man. <laughs> so we're, we're going with the Kings Indian in this tournament, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Partly for my own sake, just to see. And then also, I think it'll be a good learning experience for all of my students who did purchase the course, and they can get some extra example games and, and see how it goes uh, for me. So I'm doing that. And then also, I'm really focusing on the... Um, like I mentioned, trying to get in better shape. So I've been doing some exercising, working out, trying to make that more a uh, part of my routine. That's and, good. Yeah. With a nine to five, it's so hard. So I'm sure you appreciate like uh, the the additional time. What, what's yes. your uh, exercise of choice? Uh, usually weightlifting and racquetball right now. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, good stuff. So so you're working on the Kings Indian. Are you doing any tactics, um, like um, anything else in terms of your own uh, improvement? Yeah, just playing some uh, 10, 15 minute games every now and then. And uh, the, I don't have much time as far as playing longer games right now. We have um, two, two, two toddlers. And so it's kind of crazy at, at home. And when I do get a a long stretch of quiet time. I usually try to record a video. So <laughs> I got to squeeze in those 10, 15 minute games, but I have been practicing that way and, and trying to just analyze and figure out, you know, what am I doing wrong? Why am I losing the, nice. the normal kind of analyze your games and learn from your mistakes kind of stuff. Any thoughts of uh, getting a coach with this, uh, with these massive YouTube riches? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe nice. at some point. And uh, have the toddlers made any uh, cameos in your videos? You know, Agad Mater's dog, Mato, of course, is a celebrity in his own right. <laughs> no, I usually try to record after they're uh, in bed. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> it might happen at some point. They can open doors now, so I got to watch out for that. Yeah, I mean, and there's a big tradition in chess. Jan Gustafsson on Chess24's daughter is always making appearances. So, yeah, right, it, it, right. Could be, it could be good for business. Don't, don't discount it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and... You know, you mentioned like, again, it really seems like you've got an amazing ability to communicate like timeless principles of chess, but like in terms of the chess culture, it definitely feels like you're playing catch up. So, uh, you know, I've referenced people like Levy, like YouTube star, Agad Mater, um, Hikaru, of course, so who's, you know, from a different planet. So it's hard to compare him to the to uh, <laughs> right. us, uh, us common folk. But do you do you watch other chess YouTubers and do you have any favorites? Um, and what's your general uh, approach with that sort of thing? Yeah, so I I wish I had more time uh, because I do enjoy when you know when I do have time. But usually it's like if I have some free time, I'm gonna work on recording one of my own videos. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, when I do, I like watching Levy's recaps. His tournament recaps are interesting, and uh, Hikaru, you know, from time to time as well. 
Yeah, but I mean, your YouTube game is tight. Like, I'm not a YouTube person, as I've mentioned, but I, you know, I, I, I've watched one or two videos. So, it, I mean, it seems clearly you've done some work in terms of like optimizing your videos. Is that is that something you're doing in terms of like trying to figure out how to have the best best presentation and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that that I've kind of learned is that if I draw up an outline prior to recording the video. Uh, helps me stay on topic. Some of my videos, when I first started, I was all over the place. I, it, it's funny, people say I'm su such a good like teacher and communicator, but I really feel like I'm kind of all over the place a lot of times when I huh. explain something. And so I have to really write out an outline and it keeps me on topic. And then I, I just edit out all the sort of rambling that I do. And so I get end up with a nice video at the end, but yeah, I, I don't know. I really don't feel like I'm such a good presenter as. Wow, as well. I feel like you're really good, and I, and I and you do come off as succinct to me. Um, I mean, I, okay. I for for what it's worth, how, how long does a uh, does a typical video, like how what's the whole how many hours to create one 15 minute video? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the ones that are the the principal videos, so like where I have you know top twenty five end game principles or. Uh, you know, the top 35 just principles or those videos tend to take a while yeah. because I'll spend, I'll probably spend a good four to five hours at least just sort of brainstorming and, and compiling the list of all the ideas that I want to talk about. Um, and that's the, the long, probably the longest part. And then once I get all that together, I, I try to think up examples to go with each principle or, or each idea that I want to talk about. So that probably takes another I don't know, hour or two. And then recording um, is not too bad. And then editing, uh, you know, is a, maybe another hour on top. So th those take quite a while. Um, That's especially when you were working. That's intense, man. And yeah. like you, you were working when you did that. Like, right. Were you pumping, right. were you pumping out a video a day at that time? Um, there was phases where I did a video a day, but not uh, all the time. It mm -hmm. was kind of, you know, on the weekends, I would tend to get a couple of videos out, you know, three, four days in a row. But yeah, lot, lots of weekends and, and late nights. Wow, that's hardcore. But so, I mean, what like what drove you? I mean, you, you've mentioned you wanted a side hustle, but like how, like to what extent was like this could be a full time thing, a dream? Was it like right from the beginning or was it only when it started to gain some traction? Yeah, definitely not right from the beginning. I, I, I had no idea what was going to happen at the beginning. I remember uh, first video I recorded, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, I, I'm not really <laughs> comfortable on camera or I wasn't comfortable on camera. I turn on that uh, red light, you know, when it's recording and I'm like, what am I doing? I can't do a YouTube <laughs> channel. Like, I'm, I'm never going to make, make it. Like, what, what are you thinking, Nelson? And uh, I decided like, you know what? Uh, there's only going to be like two people who watch your video anyway. It's going to be like your wife and maybe my my mom or something <laughs> and my dad. So like, yeah, it's not a big deal. And so I just kept posting and and then I guess it was when the um, when that 35 principles video kind of took off and exploded that I started to really like gain all these subscribers all of a sudden. And I was like, okay, what's happening? And that lasted for I don't know a couple of weeks. YouTube was pushing you know all my videos at that point. That's when I kind of started to think, okay, maybe we can actually make this into some sort of a full time thing. That's amazing. The 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 chosen one from the algorithm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny too, because I mean, again, I, I think your videos are very good, but the 35 principles, like me as sort of YouTube noob, if you just told me, I would be like, that's too many principles, you know? <laughs> like like people right. are gonna get people are gonna get overwhelmed. You need you need five principles, not that not thirty-five. Right, right. But that just goes to show you that that's why I'm a podcaster. <laughs> but <laughs> but did you feel like this is an especially good video when you made that one? And I think it's like 800,000 views, right? Yeah, something like that. No, actually, I didn't know what it was going to do. That was the first type of video like that. Ah, um, so you knew I, what to do after that. Yeah, I was just experimenting with a lot of different types of videos. And I thought, you know what, let's just try to compile everything together. And I, I wanted it to be very rapid fire. That's one of the things when I watch YouTube videos, I, I don't like when people are kind of, you, you're trying to learn one thing when you watch the video, but then they start talking about all these other things and you, it's like, okay, let's get to the, the point. Yeah, so for yeah. that video, I was like, okay, I want you to learn 35 principles as quickly as possible. We're just going to go rapid fire. 
one, two, three, four, five, all the way, you know, through. And uh, I think if I remember that video is only like 20 something minutes long. So it's like less than a minute per principle. And so I think people really just like that. There's not really any downtime in the video. And um, I know the YouTube algorithm, the longer people watch your videos, the, the more likely they are to be pushed. So I think that's has a pretty high oh, uh, interesting average view duration on that on that video. What else could you tell like the non YouTube native? What else have you learned about the fabled YouTube algorithm? What else does it like? What doesn't it like? Levy's talked about it some too. Yeah, I think it's really just um, mostly click through rate and average view duration are the two big ones. People say, you know, comments and thumbs up and all these other things. But I, I think it's mostly just if you if people are clicking on the video and they're, and they're watching it for an extended period of time, that tells YouTube that, hey, this is a good video. So what's the definition of click-through rate? Uh, so, you know, like when you're scrolling YouTube and there's like... Oh, okay. The, you see it and you click. Yeah. You see it every time that, yeah, you click, that counts as a click-through. Okay. So it's if the title, base, the title and the thumbnail roped you in, basically. Right, right. And I think, you know, Levy has a lot of like interesting thumbnails. I guess he probably has someone designing. Yeah, he does. I, I do mine myself. And so I, I definitely think I could improve there. Uh, I just haven't quite figured out exactly how to how to do that yet. So I'm sure you get some people reaching out. Do you, do you tempted to hire someone or are you not quite there yet? Yeah, not quite there yet. But maybe at some point in the future, we'll, we'll consider nice. that. Cool. Well, Nelson, we're going to take one more break, and then I want to hear a bit more about your Denker triumph, and uh, then we'll, we'll wrap things up and call it an interview. Our friends at Chessable.com are constantly dropping new courses to help you work on whatever aspect of your game you're interested in improving. In addition to Grandmaster Simon Williams' latest British Grand Prix attack, we have a new course coming from Super GM Linear Dominguez in February, Dominate D4 with Dominguez's semi tirage It's been super trendy at the top level. It's a tough opening to crack. If you want to work on your endgame, there is Endgame Maze 2020, which is a practical workbook with mod Modern games And remember, whatever aspect of your game you're working on with Chessable, you can utilize space repetition to help you remember the openings, tactics, or endgame sequences that you learn from Chessable.com. All right. So, Nelson, we've got to hear about a bit more about your, uh, to my mind, crowning achievement. I managed to qualify for the Denker once, so the Denker being a tournament of state champions. And... Um, you know, it's prestigious just to get to play in it. Um, and then to win the tournament for a 2100 player at the time is, you know, a bit unusual. So could you could you walk us through that that experience? Yeah, so it was I think it was the second time that I was at the Denker. And, you know, the first time it was pretty much as expected. I, I didn't win. I think I did OK, but, you know, ended up losing to someone higher rated at some point. I don't remember even who, but I kind of had the same expectation going into it the second time. Like, all right, I'm, I believe I was seated 11th or 12th. And so I thought, all right, you know, at some point I'm going to play someone higher and lose. And I, I, I don't know, that just didn't happen. Some of the, the top rated players actually got eliminated. And so I was able to kind of squeak up a little bit there. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just was playing really well. It was, um, I, I don't even, I don't even know. I, I don't have anything I can tell you like, exactly what happened. I remember the final game against uh, Tyler Hughes. There was one moment in the game where he could have played like D5, opened up the position, and I would have been completely crushed, and he didn't play it. And I, I remember like sitting there thinking like, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do if he plays D5. Like It's, it's <laughs> good, right? And uh, he just didn't play it, played something else. And so I'm like, okay, game went on, and I was able to, to hold on. And so, yeah, it was kind of just a weird experience. But yeah, it was it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, amazing. And and I believe there was a scholarship tied to that, but you already had a scholarship. Is that right? Yeah, I think there was a, a weird requirement where UTD only gave the scholarship if the Danker winner wasn't a senior. Oh, okay. I was already a senior, but I had already applied and gotten the scholarship. So yeah, I didn't actually get the scholarship from winning it. Um, okay, but, and then yeah. and then in college, like how big a part of, uh, of your... How big a part of your life was chess? Yeah, it was definitely a big part in college. Um, you know, had to be on the on the team. We went to tournaments and stuff. And I, actually, that's where I made master. Um, I feel like I learned a little bit extra there 
just being around a lot of GMs and IMs and seeing kind of how they would think about things and um, the the chance to play in a couple extra tournaments than more than I was used to helped me get past and, and go to for twenty two hundred. So nice. And were you like, uh, I mean, grinding tactics? Like, what what was your approach? Was it mainly just going to tournaments and reviewing your games with the coaches who were like on staff? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, and just playing more. I think I just didn't I didn't play in a lot of tournaments growing up. It was a couple of big ones here and there. Um, and so, yeah, just being able to play in more tournaments gave me a, a chance to get the rating higher. Cool. And are you a blitz player? Do you play much blitz online? Yeah, too much. <laughs> <laughs> so too how's much. your blitz game? Um, it's OK. I think I'm I'm a little bit better at blitz than than regular. I'm probably 25. Oh, wow. You're strong. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think. Another sense I got from your video, I could I got the sense you're fairly tactically sharp. Um, do you think that's that's fair, yeah. like for your rating? Yes, probably so. And and like I said, you know, when I was younger, I was in really good shape, and I felt like I was just mentally very sharp. As now I'm I'm working on getting getting back there. Yeah, I mean, well, twenty five hundred blitz. I mean, especially if you took some time off. Did you, were you playing uh, like when you were working full time? Have you been? Uh, playing online in your spare time or were you like cold turkey for a while yeah i was completely i didn't even play a single game of chess for probably a couple of years so and then you was, got back into it and now you're you're 2500 blitz on on chess.com or? yeah i've hit that uh, i don't think i'm 2500 right now but still yeah yeah still. i've hit that bullet maybe it's 2500 so yeah oh man you still got the bullet skills too i'm too old for both <laughs> <laughs> i'm retired um yeah it's more instinct i don't i don't really think too much i just go with my instincts on that my instinct is to hang a piece, unfortunately. It <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work for me. Um, cool. Well, and you mentioned you're not like a huge, uh, you weren't a big book reader, but I'm sure you've read a chess book or two, Nelson. Do you have any favorites that you, I'm sure, again, I'm sure uh, your viewers are asking you, what do you recommend for them in terms of resources beyond your own uh, courses and videos? Sure, sure. Yeah, so Yasser uh, Sarawin, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, Sarawin, but his, yeah. yeah, his chess uh, endings, winning chess endings, that was really helpful growing up. Um, that was the only end book I think I, I read, an end game book that I read, and it was very helpful. That one, Bishop B5 Sicilian, I mentioned, I, that's uh, one that I, I devoured as a kid. And then, yeah, just MCO and then maybe fundamental fundamental chess openings probably would be the, the ones that I would recommend. Man, that shows your age. You can't be rec- – I mean, fundamental chess openings, that's the one with, like, the explanations of every opening, though, right? Yeah, it's, it's like a very uh, sort of high level. They don't really get into too much theory. It's just kind of yeah. like – Yeah. I take it back what I was saying then because, yeah, that is a good book because people are always looking for, like, something that explains the ideas, you know? And, right, and that's, right. like, the, the rare opening encyclopedia that that does, does explain some ideas. I was thinking of MCO for a second, which – is just reams of variations that are yes. out, outdated now. So I had that one too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah very that, different. Yeah, that had its time, but but that that uh that time has passed. Um, and so you mentioned your two toddlers. So how old are they exactly, Nelson? Yeah, one and three. Oh wow! And yeah. boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. Yeah, two what? girls, two girls, two girls. Nice. And we have another one on the way. So wow, yeah. busy, busy. Um, yep. and do you like being a dad? Yes. Yeah, I do. And I, uh, enjoy it. yeah, it's, uh, me too. It's uh, life changing for sure. Yeah. And um, what are you? So you mentioned you're you're getting back into sports. Do you have any other like big big hobbies? Um, big hobby? No, no. Uh, racquetball, working out. Uh, I used to play soccer. I don't really have a place to play. Yeah, anymore. you were like pretty good, right? Yeah, I was pretty. I was always pretty athletic, good at sports and and stuff. So um, yeah, I did I did that a lot in college. And uh, I don't know, 34 just feels, it feels older than I am. It's, it's only the beginning yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a 45 year old. Um, and okay, Nelson, closing thing I want you to give, say, I know you're, you're good with the bullet points or the, the listicles. So I want you to give um, three bits of advice for, and I'm putting you on the spot here so you can, you can pun okay. if it's too cruel, but okay. let's start with three bits of advice for just uh, content creators. Chess content creators. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's see. Number one, I guess really focus on what you think your viewer would most want to see as opposed to what you most want to create. 
So try to focus on the viewer as, as opposed to just yourself. And I think you'll, you'll end up with a better video. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, I guess I, I already mentioned it, but the 1% rule. You it's know, okay. It doesn't have to, you know, try these, to are, pick, these are your top three. It's okay yeah, yeah. to try, yourself. Try to just improve on one thing each, uh, each time. And uh, that's, yeah, that helped me a lot because it simplifies it. You don't have to fix it all at once. You fix one thing at a time and you just keep, keep cranking away. And then uh, the third thing, I guess, just, just enjoy, you know, the process. Cause if you take it too seriously and you can get burned out and uh, you know, you get caught up in like chasing the numbers and th there's always going to be someone, yeah. there's always going to be someone in front of you unless you're Levy, I guess, but <laughs> for everybody else, you know, you're always right. going to be chasing someone. And so just kind of enjoy and be thankful for, for where you're at, I guess I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. I'm, I'm lucky that podcasts aren't like as directly measurable, so I don't I don't have to worry about right. that stuff as much. But it's definitely uh, good advice to focus on on your own product and and yourself. All right, right. and and last but not least, I mean, we already covered this some, but like three three bits of chess advice that that you could give as a parting wisdom, Nelson. Um, yeah. So number one, I mean, just have fun, enjoy the game. Uh, I think you'll learn more and um, it'll just be, yeah. I, you know, a lot of people get caught up in the ratings and uh, win, winning streaks and losing streaks and um, just have fun. Enjoy, enjoy the game. It's a beautiful game. Enjoy it. And uh, that's number one. Um, let's see. Number two, don't give up. It's also a challenging game and you got to stick with it. But yeah, most people, uh, who stick with it do eventually see improvement. And uh, I guess number three is uh, go check out some Just Vibes videos. Maybe they'll help you. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And sign up for the Patreon and, you yeah. know, check out the courses if they enjoy it. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, Nelson, I mean, it's really a great story. It's great to see your success. Um, and, and yeah, looking forward to see what else you can cook up in the in the coming years. All right. Thanks a lot, Ben. I appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate yeah. And I'm guessing... Me. Oh sure, my pleasure. And I'm guessing sub on YouTube is the main the main point of contact for you, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> oh, and I did want to ask you, sorry, we're saying our goodbyes, but I mean so many YouTube people end up Twitch streaming and vice versa. Any thoughts of firing that up or or no? Yeah, it's definitely on the oh, it's definitely on my radar. Um it's hard right now with, with the kids because right. uh I don't have a lot of time when I can do that without them running around in the background but <laughs> again maybe, that's a that's a um a feature not a bug right right maybe i can try it one time and see how it goes but uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see okay all right man well congrats again and uh thanks for taking the time for the interview i enjoyed it all right thanks a lot ben appreciate it thanks to everyone who helps make perpetual chess possible big shout out to my producer matthew passy i'd also like to thank the blue wire podcast network with whom we are proud to be affiliated be sure to follow us on social media benny fischel one on twitter at perpetual chess on instagram and or you can join the perpetual chess facebook group you can email me ben at perpetual and of course last but not least i'd like to give major thanks to the perpetual chess patreon and paypal supporters those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show have access to live zoom q a lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games answering questions stuff like that and you can even get access to ad free perpetual chess if that's your preference so but most of all thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode